Hey, welcome to worship here with Memorial United Methodist Church of Clovis, California. We are so blessed to be able to be together and worship across the miles and, and time zones and even cultures. We're just so blessed to be able to worship and praise our wonderful God. Today is Native American Awareness Sunday, and we're blessed to have with us our good friend, Ron Good, who's an elder with the North Fork Mono Tribe. And uh, we'll be having some good conversation with him today about the word abide. And um, just want to invite you to um, prepare yourselves. I'm going to offer a prayer. We'll have some centering time. And then Ron and Diane will lead us in the call to worship. And Nancy will lead us in the opening hymn. But right now, let's just have a prayer together and center our hearts for worship. Loving God, we ask that you would help us to set aside any distractions that would impede our ability to focus on you. Help us to open our hearts and minds fully before you so that in this time, you might reach in and touch us and renew us and inspire us and transform our lives. So that having gathered for worship in this way, we would be empowered to follow Jesus more faithfully throughout the week. And we lift this to you in his name and in the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Jenny, would you lead us in our centering music? Jesus Christ is with us. Jesus Christ is our Savior. Jesus Christ died for our sin. Jesus Christ saves our life. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Please join me in the hymn, I Need Thee Every Hour. Not a dark, 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 
Andy's going to lead us in our prayer time, and then Sheila will lead us in the scriptures, and Connie will lead us in the children's moment. Thank you. And please join in saying the unison prayer. O oh Lord and God, you are worthy to receive glory, honor, and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were given existence and life. Lord God Almighty, how great and wonderful are your deeds. King of the nations, how right and true are your ways. Who will not stand in awe of you, Lord? Who will refuse to declare your greatness? You alone are holy. All the nations will come and worship you because your just actions are seen by all. Now God's salvation has come. Now God has shown his power as king. Now his Messiah has shown his authority. So be it. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Please remain in the attitude of prayer for the prayers of the people. O God, our Father, who has led us apart from the busy world into the quiet of your house, grant us grace to worship you in spirit and in truth to the comfort of our souls and the upbuilding of every good purpose and holy desire through Christ our Lord. We hear now those names of countries, individuals and organizations struggling to improve living conditions and promote peace. The stalemate over gun rights and the need to curb gun violence and the spike in violence against Asian and Asian Americans. In your great mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. We offer up names of those who are hurting physically and mentally, those who are sick or recovering. Hear their names now. Those needing prayers in our worship slide, also from the chat box, Ron Sestovnik, Ask for prayers for his brother, Lee, in the hospital with hernia issues. Shua asked for uh, prayers for his brother who suffered a stroke and is in the hospital. In your great mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. There are many with life struggles who need to feel your presence. So many are working through issues of their employment, family relationships, housing issues, finances, or grief of all kinds. Hear their names now. Pastor Jeanette and her family preparing to move to Santa Rosa, be with them as they pack and do all the stuff that needs to be done. In your great mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. We are so grateful, God, that we have light moments in our lives and you want to share in those too. Please hear our happy news now. We get to worship in person next week. Also the beautiful music today by Jenny. The pleasure of having Ron Good with us today. And Jamie Belt says in the chat box, her daughter Tia's health scare is all better. Let the people say, thanks be to God. Our Father, we thank you for this invigorating day and for all the hopes that enliven the human heart. Help us, we pray, to see all that goes on in this world from your point of view and empower us with your spirit, that, me, that we may respond not only in our hearts and minds, but also in your words and in our actions. Amen. Now for the Lord's Prayer, remember to let the Hmong languages begin first. Let us join together in the prayer Jesus taught us as we say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us as we trespass, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We, we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's good and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to refuses help? Little children, let us love not in word or speech, but in truth and action. And by this, we know that we are all from the truth and will reassure our hearts before him whenever our hearts condemn us for God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God and we receive him whatever we ask because we obey his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we shall believe in his name of Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. All who obey his commandments abide in him, and he abides in them. And by this, we know that he abides in us, by the spirit that he has given us. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome, children of God, for the children's moment. <laughs> there once was a young boy named Evan who couldn't see very well. The funny thing was, he didn't even know it. In fact, no one knew it, not his mother or father, his grandmother or his grandfather. Not even his closest friends knew that Evan couldn't see very well. Evan thought that everything in the world had soft, fuzzy edges because that is the way the world looked to him. He thought that all children saw things just the way he saw them. As he got older, his mother began to wonder why Evan always sat so close to the TV. Oops, sorry guys, <laughs> went too far. <laughs> his grandfather noticed that when Evan looked at a book, he held it very close to his face. When Evan began school, he told the teacher that he couldn't see the words on the whiteboard very well. Finally, everyone realized that maybe Evan needed glasses. Evan's parents took him to an eye doctor and she told them, yep, Evan needs glasses. In a few short days, Evan had a new pair of glasses. At first he was afraid that the other kids would make fun of him because he had to wear glasses. But when he put the glasses on, he put his worries behind him. Oh, so sorry. This is not working the way it's supposed to be. Wow, the world looked so different. Suddenly, Evan realized that everything in the world did not have fuzzy edges. He discovered that trees have separate individual leaves. He could read a book without holding it right up to his face. He could see his mother's face clearly, even when she was all the way across the room. It was great. You may not have trouble with your eyesight, but all of us have a hard time seeing and understanding things at times. Our Bible story today takes place just three days after Jesus was killed and shows how some of Jesus' disciples had trouble understanding what they had seen. Since there were no cameras in Jesus' time, the pictures for our Bible story are an artist's idea of what people and places looked like back then. When Jesus died, his friends thought he had, was gone forever. They didn't know what to do. They were very sad. They couldn't see things clearly because they were so mixed up and so upset. Two of Jesus' friends were sadly walking back to their home in the village of Emmaus when another traveler joined them on the road. They didn't recognize him, but they began to talk to him and to tell him all about what had happened to Jesus and how sad they were. When it was evening, they arrived at their home and invited the stranger to stay with them and have supper. They sat down to eat, and when the traveler broke the bread and blessed it, something happened. 
It was, if, it was as if they had put on Evan's glasses. Suddenly, they saw clearly what they hadn't seen before, even though they were looking right at it most of the day. They realized that the stranger who had joined them on the road was Jesus, alive and well. After Jesus left them that very night, they ran back to Jerusalem to tell the other disciples. Sometimes we feel confused or upset or sad, and our feelings keep us from seeing things clearly. When that happens, we need help understanding our lives better. It helps to remember that Jesus is right beside us all the time, walking with us and ready to listen. Jesus helps us understand that God loves us and that God wants only the best for us. Let's pray. God, we are thankful that as we travel along life's road, Jesus is walking with us and that he will help us see and understand the things that happen in our life. Amen. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Connie. So I would just want to put a little plug in here. Um, so that wonderful story about the, the journey to Emmaus, um, setting up for the Sunday school class. And um, we do have Sunday school on Zoom. And um, if you want the, the Zoom code, then just call the church office and we'll get your kids hooked into that. We have a elementary class and we have the uh, junior high high school class. And also um, we have our um, adult Sunday school class that is also meeting. And um, Andy's been facilitating that, but um, he's about to, What I think you've been at this like five years now maybe more. And and, then, and so he's going to get to step back and Fran's going to take over facilitating that class. Um, but I um, encourage all of you to um, get involved with the Sunday school class and um, it will uplift you. And thank you, Connie, for sharing that story because it's a wonderful story to lead into our conversation today as we are talking about um, about the scripture and a thing about abide. And here's the thing. Um, the story from Luke about the the people journeying to Emmaus and, and the disciples being so sad and, and, you know, they had good reason to be sad. And, uh, and they had really good reason to be confused and lost because they didn't understand that Jesus had risen. But when we gather, we've, it's been almost 2000 years since Jesus resurrection day and we know the end of the story, right? And we still need those glasses. <laughs> we still have trouble seeing stuff. And, and part of why we gather together is to talk and to learn new things and, um, and understand the scriptures in ways we hadn't understood before. And so this week, as I was looking at the scripture text, um, and it, kept, it was talking about abide, to abide in God's love. Um, you can't um, like see somebody who's need needs something, and if you have the means to help them, withhold those means and pretend like that you have God's love in your heart, right? You can't abide in God's love, um, and 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 then the author of the, uh, the that letter just keeps saying, you know, follow my commandments, love how I love. If you do this, you will abide in my love, and and says don't don't love only in thoughts and in words, but in truth and in action. And then says, if you love people, you will abide in my love. And I got to thinking about the glasses, my glasses, right? I put on the new glasses and I went, oh my gosh. I always think of abide as kind of a stationary thing. Like um, there is somebody's abode, right? A house where you live, right? That's your abode. You abide there. It's one spot. You're kind of stuck there. When you abide in Jesus, you're always planted in Jesus. But as I was reading this scripture this week, I suddenly realized abiding is an active thing. It's, it's not stationary. It's not passive. Because, to, because God is telling us if we, if we love each other, then we can abide in God, right? And love is active. It's not passive. It's not stationary. And this idea that Jesus goes with us as that beautiful prayer that um, Connie read, Jesus is with us as we're moving. And I was thinking, wow, I've been thinking about abide 
perhaps in, in a very limited way and there would be a much more full way. And then I thought, wow, what a perfect scripture for this week because this week we're gonna have Ron Good with us. And I just love having Ron with us and enjoy having conversations with Ron. Um, the United Methodist Church, every year we have a special Sunday set aside where we take time to learn more about the indigenous people of this area um, before uh, the mass immigration from all, the rest of the world, particularly from Europeans, and, um, and all the ways that life changed. But um, uh, most Europeans and, um, and many Asians also, but especially Europeans, they, they didn't respect the native peoples at all. Um, most of them, some of them did. Um, John Wesley had really great respect for the native peoples, but most Europeans really didn't and, um, and, and felt justified in shoving them off their land and confiscating it for their own use. And, and as we're trying to dismantle racism, we realize that we have to um, undo those ideas that uh, were part of the founding of this country and we need to um, do what we can to learn more about the people whose lives were so disrupted. And as we do that, we discover that um, there's a whole lot of wisdom and there's a whole lot of commonality in our faith and our understanding of God. And in the United Methodist Church, we don't actually just limit it because this is a global denomination. And we recognize that worldwide, um, people have displaced indigenous peoples. And so throughout the world, in whatever country we have United Methodist churches, the people in those countries are taking time to learn more about the indigenous peoples and to find commonalities and to build bridges of relationship and understanding and create a more peaceful and loving, mutually respectful way to um, live together and also um, to practice abiding in that love of sharing with each other. So I'm really excited to have Ron here. And um, so Ron, I wanna just talk with you because um, the European concepts that have um, grown and developed in this country, um, I think they've morphed from, from probably the values that, that founded the country. But right now there's a whole lot of um, individualism and personal um, faith. And, um, and this concept of abide um, is like, like I need to abide in Jesus, right? One and one, me and Jesus. But I'm thinking that Native Americans probably have a different understanding of the, of the concept of abiding. And I'm wondering if you might share with us a little bit about your understanding of what it means to abide. Yeah, I can um, certainly try. Thanks. Um, you know, I always enjoy listening to you and listening to your thoughts. Um, I think that, you know, we, we as people have come a long ways. We had such a long journey yet to go, but it's nice, you know, to look at uh, your group that's here today, and I won't call it a congregation because I know that you have a variety of folks here and you know especially the, the Hmong folks as well who are joining in I was uh, with Fresno Unified when they first came and was pretty detrimental in helping their leaders uh, organize in this town and work with their families and work with their their children and and the key part of that was their culture and understanding their culture. And it's the one part that of course, when they were brought here, they were told in, they were told that basically, you know, this wasn't a place for their culture. And so, you know, that whatever they practiced uh, back at home couldn't be practiced here because America looked at things different, saw things different. But those that we're talking are still, you know, some of the ones that are still talking today in terms of trying to hold on to something that isn't real, you know. Um, 
and I think when you when we look at this word, um, uh, we have to look to understand that we have faith in our belief. And many people put those words as one, but they are not. You know, faith in our belief, faith in our belief system, faith in our culture, faith in our uh, livelihood. This particular uh, way of life that that we had had to have an understanding that that we were here for the duration, that we were put here to be uh, at one with earth and to take care of it because it would take care of us. Yeah. And our, our faith and in our belief was always that, as you already stated and, and, and the other nice gentleman stated earlier was, you know, uh, creator, gave life to all things. Mm. And so with that understanding, we as Native Americans look at all things as relatives, that we are all related and that there's a, a commonality in our relationship. There's a connectedness in our relationship that, that we have to have, um, this connectedness and that and to start off is like um, water fire and land they all go together they're what well, we we say they're intermarried you know we we actually say that water married earth and they had you know a mischievous son called fire water constantly follows fire around and earth follows fire and when earth goes behind fire she rejuvenates the land so when you put fire on the land you are also bringing back water and so because you're taking away what is dead and dying you're removing what is um, needs to be opened so that the land can absorb the water and hold the water so that the land can absorb sunlight. And then it reproduces a land that is gonna be sustainable for all people and all species. So wherever we put fire, the first thing that we're counting and that we do observance on is what species do we see? Meaning a wood rat, a mouse, a lizard, a butterfly, a dragonfly, a coyote, a bear, a deer, a cat, lion, a duck, a turkey, all these things come back to the land when we have put fire on there because after fire we now have water yeah. and when we have water now we have flowers now we have fresh food now we have rejuvenated plants for our traditional culture of making baskets and you know uh, a hand clapper you know like like this one to to, to, that we use as an instrument, which came from one of our fires. And so, you know, these things are in, not important to our culture, but the important part is the relationship between fire, land, and water, and then what that means to us. And we start all of our events with uh, prayer, with song, and you know because that's the most important part is speaking to the spirits of the land and to creator and to mother earth and when we have that you know we are abiding we are abiding 
within our faith and our belief that when we put fire on the land, I know what kind of resources are going to come back. I know what kind of medicine plants are going to come back. And I, and I shouldn't, don't want you to get to understanding that I know each medicine that's going to come back. And sometimes I have to actually go into a book and look up a certain medicine. But what I know is that medicines are going to come back. What I know is the food resources and all the cultural resources are going to come back healthy. And that is what we know. And that is our faith in our belief system. And so, um, so as I'm listening, I'm hearing, I'm, I'm doing comparisons in my head. And, um, and so abiding, um, what I'm hearing is that for Native Americans, concepts of, of individual are not, um, are not lacking, they're not absent, but it's not the focus. That, that community being in community, being a relationship, that that's the focus. Um, and that, 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 that's the deepest value is being in relationship. And so, um, and so because everything was made by God, then everything is your siblings. And so being in relationship with everything is, is um, foundational. And so, um, so when you're abiding in God, God, it says, you know, you need to, you need to love. And as you love, you abide. And so for Native Americans, their understanding is um, to show love for all of creation, not just for other humans, not just for their own, own family, but to show love for all of creation, because all of creation is family. And we're in relationship with all of creation. But one of the things that I really heard that I want to explore just a little more deeply, you said, we're here for the long haul. And, and that's why you take care of the land in this way to um, bring forth new uh, life and um, continue. But I'm thinking, um, I'm thinking for most people with the, with the Western understandings, when we're talking about abiding, we're talking about abiding for our lifetime. And at the end of our lifetime, we stop abiding here, right? And, um, and, but that's not for the natives. They talk about abiding because they're community and relational oriented. When they're talking about abiding, we're here for the long haul. They're talking about all the generations abiding, that your abiding doesn't end at your life lifespan, that the abiding continues in the future. And so the decisions that are being made aren't just for yourself, but always with the eye for future generations. Am I, am I getting this correct? Am I, is this making sense? Am I understanding you correctly? You always have. <laughs> That's why I'm going to miss you so much. And uh, just, you know, I'm sure there's, sure the others are too, but uh, you know, that's been our, our topic is where are you going? You know, I know other people need you, but no, well, you know, when I look back and, and you know, um, you know, in, in, in archeological data, we've been here 10 to 15,000 years. That's how we look to the future. Yes, our lifespan is short on, on earth, but, our our generation and our legacy will continue uh, not only in what we teach what we practice but what we believe and no matter what um no matter what we've endured whether it's the the european coming or or whom or a pandemic it matters not because we know that we're going beyond that. And for the Native American, I, mean, I don't mean to get on the dark side, but for the Native American, since the 1700s, we have endured one to two pandemics a century. 
you know, over the last four centuries. And it's pretty, uh, pretty devastating. It took a lot of toll and such a toll that in 1800, we had 350,000 Indians uh, on the land. And that's a, a, a you know, a, a generic number. But by 1900, not so generic was only 35,000 of us left in, Cal in California. So only 10% in 100 years, you know, to what, what happened to us, right? In all these things that happened. And so, you know, but yet here we are. And today, California ho hosts the most, the largest Native American population, not just California Indians, but Indians from all over who want to come to California and be in California. So I think that's a pretty good, you know, tribute to how we think and how we practice and how we look forward to being able to do things. Um, you know, it, it's, it's one of your verses that you had there was, is that, you know, if you have all the riches and you won't share it or you won't use it to benefit somebody, how is that abiding? In, in our culture or in my culture, because all the Native American cultures vary a little, but in mine, we have no thank you. We have no word for thank you. Because it's more of a pay it forward. And if somebody has, you know, taken care of you, then you need to take care of somebody else. If there are people who do not follow that system, then, then they don't either wish to follow um, that belief, in which means then they will now be on their own and they will not be helped in any manner. And that system we had in many of the different tribes in terms of uh, family and community and faith, that if you had no one to take care of you and you didn't take care of anybody, then no one was going to take care of you. Now that's a hard line, but in that line, uh, as Native Americans, we don't have what we call welfare in America. Because the important aspect is that each of us, each of us have an, a role to play to keep the sustainability of our community and the relationships that we have here on earth going forward. So, you know, and that's why we also look then to every species, every grass, every invasive plant, every bird, every insect, they have a role and importance. So to look back though, as since you, you know, this is Native American week as you look at it, and what colonial America did to the land and to the people and are still doing it even today. But, you know, we had 60 million Buffalo and there might be two or three herds of a thousand left. We had grizzly bears and we have grizzly bears on our flag in California, but we have no grizzly bears. You know, we had wolf, wolf is starting to come back. Wolf is so important for the ecological system, but wolf was wiped out. Salmon been removed. We, we go to New Zealand to the salmon farms to try to get salmon to come back to our rivers. And, you know, and then now we talk about how we need water and we need tunnels 
to bring water to our urban areas and to our farms and bypass, you know, the, the, uh, the Bay Area and that the little fishies, the little smelt, you know, they don't have any meaning. But it's just another aspect of our colonial thinking that everything is a commodity and that we're not looking then where is that word abiding when we practice like that. It's not there. So the abiding would, but the abiding cannot happen outside of relationships. Abiding in God, abiding in God's love cannot actually happen outside of relationships. And I think that the scripture today uh, from the first letter of John, the third chapter, I think that that is so clearly pointing to that, but I had never noticed that before. I needed those glasses, Connie. I needed those glasses of faith to, to really recognize that God is saying, uh, John, um, God through this letter from John is saying, um, you can't abide in God's love. You can't abide in God. God's love cannot be in your heart if you are not in relationship to other people. If you harden your heart and turn people away, you cannot be, you cannot abide in God. You can only do that through being in relationships with each other as well as it's not just I accepted Jesus into my heart. It's you, you have to live that out in relationship to each other. And, and I think that, that, that that's where the sustainability comes in is, is always looking ahead how do we how do we support these relationships and 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 recognizing that um, I just really appreciate the the concept that you know God created everything and consequently since God has created us and God has created the planet and God has created the trees we're all made of God and consequently we're all siblings together it's just beautiful and and so Native Americans then are telling us sustainability is the issue that that has to be in relationship. It can't just be for the moment. It can't just be individual and personal. It has to be relationships and those relationships have to sustain. And that is what abiding actually is. I think I'm getting that right. But it's exciting to me. I had never really thought of it that way. This is the first time in reading that scripture this week that my eyes were open. I guess I had my glasses on correctly. Um, anyway, so um, Ron, what else, because you know what, our time is a little tight, I'm so sorry. What else can we talk about today? What else do you want to share with us? That's just um, something that we really need to um, know and understand to help us grow in our ability to um, have good relationships with our Native American uh, neighbors. Well, you know, um, I think that your, you, what you said earlier was you know it's not just about a faith and a belief and that it's not about words it's about actions and um there's a couple of things one we put fire on the ground if we are to, if we were to look at the 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 plop the policies and regulations of our government, then I would have to tell you that we put fire on the ground illegally. But we cover ourselves and we put the fire on the ground because we know this is what Mother Earth needs. But the regulations don't say that, right? So this is what we have to live with and work with. Now we could not do nothing and where would that get us? You know, you could not stand up and make a statement and, we're, and, and do nothing, where would that get you? So you have to be strong. You have to be strong, not only as a, a congregation, as a body of Christ, 
as a preacher, you know, as a leader. But a little thing that is meant so much is that your congregation donated a $1,500 check to one of my tribal members who was impacted by the creek fire. And we went, took a walk up there. We saw what the tractors did that tore up his, his water pipeline. And he's struggling to try to get his water down. It took him four months to get his water back. He was lucky to actually get his spring back. They sometimes go dry when things like that happen. And his storage tanks are basically shot. He's trying to make one work and the other one is gone. So he needs a lot of help. I plan to try to seek more help for him. But that little bit of contribution is not a little bit. It, it was huge for him to see that, you know, there were such good people out there willing to just, you know, don't know him and didn't even know what his damage was. And he is one of those that was not going to go out and tell the world what they did to him. He just took it and said, I'll do the best that I can with it. But he was very happy to receive the contribution. And so was I. That is a is a is a uh, a sharing of strength that you know is unequivocal and i thank you very much from my heart you know and from his he was so happy it won't resolve all his problems it just the fact that somebody reached out to him will help a whole lot so thank you. Thank we'll all talk, of you. We'll, we'll talk about that just a little bit, uh, a little bit more in just a little bit. But I do have two things more that I heard just briefly in there. Um, that um, the Native Americans dealt with fire very differently than the European immigrants. And the current policy is, um, I think most of California can see that there's some flaws in our current policy um, with the wildfires that we have to deal with every year. And so I think that Ron is, is inviting us to learn. Um, Ron has taken some of us up into the meadows to learn about the water system and to do water um, meadow restoration. But he is also involved in doing cultural burns in, uh, in, a, in our area of the state. And um, I would encourage you to um, talk with Ron and learn more about what the cultural burns are. And, um, and then um, might be something that this congregation could do to help uh, shift concepts and policies uh, for our state on how to manage our forests and our wildlands in such a way that the earth can thrive and, um, and humans can thrive and perhaps we won't have quite as devastating of wildfires. So that's just one thing I'm just not not gonna, that's just a little seed. Maybe that could be something to look at in the future. But then I did want to ask one more thing about sustainability, Ron. When Native Americans are talking about um, looking to the future, um, when I was in seminary, they told me the decisions we make in ministry today will impact ministry 20 to 30 years from now. So when Native Americans are looking and they're making decisions about what they need to be doing, are they looking like 2000 years from now? How far out are they looking 20 to 30 years? What are they looking at? What, what, what the Native American concept of sustainability, they're looking towards the future. How far out do they look? Well, you know, um, I, I couldn't really tell you how far out we look. We, we typically say our grandchildren's grandchildren. So from me, from me, my grandchildren's grandchildren, that's seven generations. And then, you know, and then that's basically about 120 to 150 years. All right. Well, all you have to go back is, this is, you know, 2021, right. go back to 1900 and see 
the changes that we have gone through in America and the things that we have gone through, not, not only in exploration, in technology, in social justice, environmental justice, all these different things that, you know, and even, even from a religious standpoint, you know, what are all these, the changes that have taken place and how, you know, how, how is that, what's the outcome? And so we as, we as native uh, indigenous leaders, the, we are always looking at what the outcome is. When I speak with agencies about their concepts and about their projects, I'm asking about the outcomes. I'm asking them to tell me what the end result is going to be, not after their project, but well beyond their project. What is the point of your project? Whether it's a, a fire break or a prescribed fire, or you know road access or no road access whatever kind of decision making and when we look at the forest for instance and we go back 20 years maybe 25 when they shut down all the roads because they weren't logging anymore those roads were their fire breaks which they don't have because they all got overgrown and they don't exist. And then when they put a, a fire line in, they just tear stuff up like they did with Mr. Grigsby. Instead of leaving things in place that you go back further than to when the, the Native American lived on the land out there. We, we're still here, we're still on the land, but we're not living out there. Mm -hmm. When we did, we had trails everywhere. I'm recording my trail system, our old historic trail system, mm -hmm. where these trails went. These trails were, they were little pathways, but they were travelways. And every travelway was wide open <laughs> because I wasn't the only one traveling on there. Right. And if a fire came and I needed to escape, bear and her cubs are leaving, elk and her cubs, lion and her cubs, you know, and hopefully somebody don't get hungry along the way and look at my cubs. So things had to be open. We couldn't all be on one little bitty trail. And that is the same way that when uh, Fremont came through in the 40, 1840s and Walker came through in 1834 and, and um, you know, John Muir came through in 1850s, 1860s. What they wrote was how open the land was and how open the trails were. And what John Muir looked at was the Indian people in their bark teepees. All they had to do was step out of their, their wigwams or whatever he wanted to call them and they had a garden of eden well that's like saying then if you go back to the bible that you know adam and eve were were had an eden well how did that happen you know why why were they placed there with an eden why were they given that to them because creator set that up for them and it was their responsibility to continue having that eden and many religious groups and faiths are constantly talking about someday we're all going to have an eden someday and everybody has that responsibility to be creating that eden now not someday because we need to have that for the future of our people. 
that's sustainability. Thank you so much. And that would be the long-term concept of abiding that we need to embrace. Thank you for sharing with us today, Ron. I'm gonna offer a prayer and, uh, and then I'll, I'll have a little bit more sharing. Let's have a prayer. <laughs> God, we are grateful for our um, neighbors, the Native Americans. Um, we're grateful that we've been able to begin getting to know people and, and building relationships. We ask that you would help us to listen attentively and to learn from one another, um, particularly as we encounter um, difficulties and um, that you would help us to get some new glasses to understand what you're asking of us in new ways so that we might be more faithful in following Jesus, that your love would abide in us and that it would flourish not only for us, but for our grandchildren's grandchildren. And we lift this up to you in the name of Jesus and the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah. And so, um, we come to a time when we would um, take the offering. We're uh, so grateful for everybody who's been supporting the ministries, particularly through this time of pandemic, um, mailing their checks in using the QR code that's on the last slide of the announcements, um, going on our website, making contributions through the tabs there. Um, it has been wonderful. We are deeply appreciative of all the support that we've been able to get. And um, I want to share one thing that happened um, at Christmas time, part of our Christmas offering was used to help somebody from um, North Fork Mono Tribe who's recovering from fire damage. And so I got to go with Ron this week and um, we walked the trails with uh, Stacy Grim Grigsby. And um, we're gonna go ahead and look at a slide here. Um, and so this is uh, right across the street, um, Stacy's property that the um, fire came right to the road and it did jump the road and start burning on one of the barns, but um, the firefighters were actually camped in Stacy's front yard. And so they got over and got the fire out before it destroyed the whole barn, but um, it was right there. And so what we're looking at here, this is Stacy, and he's looking at his, um, his water um, cisterns really. So one of them, the one on the left is uh, metal and it is still usable. And the one on the right was concrete, but it had a wooden roof and the roof um, burnt. And so that one is not really, it can't keep the water clean. Um, and, so, um, and so this is what we're helping to rebuild. His water supply comes from a spring that's up the hill from where his house is. And so let, let's go ahead and see the next slide. Um, So we walked the land and, um, and Ron said to Stacy, he said, so who put this road in? You know, when, you know, I see where your walking trail is for maintaining the line for your, uh, for, for your water system. But when, you know, who put the road in here that, and he said, the fire people put it in last year. They came in with the bulldozers and put this, this road in. And so the road wasn't there before. It came just a year ago, um, uh, just last fall. And what happened was um, in the effort to get up the hill, because the fire was coming over the hill. So in the effort to get up the hill and create a, a break, they took their bulldozers up and just, you know, plowed out vegetation and made a space to make a fire break. But when they did that, they rolled over his pipes that ran from the spring up the hill down to the cisterns and um, they damaged the pipes. And, um, and, and then the firefighters who'd been camping with him said, oh, you know, oh, I see what we've done, you know, and so they kind of helped him bend, try to bend the pipes back and get it reconnected and they kind of had it going okay. But then, then there were other fire units there as well. And one of them had a backhoe and as they were leaving the scene, the backhoe pulled up, it, the backhoe the pipe was just a little bit raised off the ground and the backhoe's scoop caught the pipe. And as they drove out with that backhoe, it just pulled it and it just pulled it out, wrenched it up, ruined the pipe beyond being able to use. And so, um, so like Ron was saying, it took him four months to get the pipes rerun. You can see that he has a disability. His back is bad, like many, many of you who have worked in service industries where you're doing maintenance and repairs, the back goes out. And, and so he and his father um, got up and worked on it. And if you look down at the uh, bottom left-hand corner, you can see, um, the white line, that's the, the pipe 
Um, a little bit up from that is the metal pipe. That's part of it that got wrenched out and ripped away. And you can't see it here, but off to the left of the picture, it was just sticking up in the air all discombobulated. So they laid new line. But the problem is, is that it's plastic and it's exposed. And so it will eventually rot and break. And so um, and so we have um, our, our offering from Christmas then is going to help Stacy's family as they're going to be replacing the line with more permanent line and um, getting a new cistern to replace the old one that got burned. And so um, go ahead one more time, one more slide. And so um, I was able to share with him the check from our Christmas offering. And this is um, the property behind us there, um, part of his land where he lives up uh, outside of Aubury. And so this is your contributions. They're, they're really helping um, Stacy and his family. And I just wanted you to know um, how wonderful, it, how wonderful it is to be able to know that we have made a real difference in somebody's life, and um, and uh, their family will be able to live again. I did want to share with you that when the they got the water running at first, um, it was okay, and then the rain came and the water turned mucky because it had burned all the vegetation and the mud started getting down into the spring. So they had to go back up and dig the spring out and try to clear it so that they could get fresh water again. But they were successful in that. And as Rana is saying, sometimes after a fire, the springs don't come back. But the spring is working again for now. And uh, we're grateful that it is working and it's flowing pure water for him again and for his family. And so um, he'll be able to um, collect that water and, and, uh, and, and put in good pipes and uh, and that's because of your good work. So thank you everybody for the, for supporting the ministries here at Memorial. So we're gonna move on into our song of praise for God, our doxology, and Nancy will lead us in the doxology and then she will, will lead us in the prayer of dedication after the doxology and then right into the unison benediction. And then um, Nancy will lead us in our closing hymn. Please join me in singing the doxology. Amen. Please join in saying the unison benediction. And now to our God, who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish far more abundantly than all we can ask or imagine. To God be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus our Lord to all generations forever, amen. And please join with me in singing the hymn, Abide With Me.
Enjoy!